I'm Dr. Michael Natola. And I'm Megan Strong. In today's case of the week, we take a down and dirty close up look at the Bruxer Full Arch Implant Prosthesis. And what would you do if you were in prison with only five teeth and no toothpaste? Well, you're on a roll. I'd say pass the Ben and Jerry's. And speaking of Ben and Jerry's, stick around for the bloopers where a pregnant Megan is clearly craving it and lovingly describes her five favorite flavors. That and more on today's Chairside Life. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 93 of Chairside Live. Megan, how are you today? I'm doing really well today. I don't want to make this, every time I talk, I don't want it to be about my pregnancy, but today I'm 24 weeks. 24 weeks. Yeah. And you're wearing a you're wearing a shirt that before used to be big and now fits you perfectly. Yeah, it's snug as a bug in a rug, so we're good. You didn't even know when you bought it that it would end up being maternity wear. Look at that. See, so when you Providence. buy incorrect sizes, you can just hold on to them now. Mm -hmm. We Guys do that too. Okay. Most of us tend to have a pair of fat jeans. Okay, I and, think that's a female thing too. And skinny jeans. Yeah. So you can kind of tell where you are without having to use a scale, <laughs> just based on how they fit. Perfect. I like to go to my friends' houses, and if they have like a size 38 jeans, that's their fat jeans. I like to replace it with an identical pair of 36 and oh freak them out. Oh my gosh. But guys don't care. Okay. They'll just go to sweats. They oh. just go to an expandable Wonderful. elastic waistband. And if they're married, they know it doesn't matter. Sounds good. And on a different note, how are you doing? I'm fine. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. Uh, pr I'm not pregnant at all. Okay. Um, all my injuries have uh, healed up. Back training again, and uh, things are good. Nice. Watch out for those women road bikers. I huh? know, especially when they fall into me. They'll get it, you. Um, somebody suggested she was hitting on me, but I don't think that was it. I think she should have just said hi. I think that was more of like a literal joke, hitting on you. you yeah, know, maybe yeah. it was. It was a double entendre that went right Whoops. over my head. Sailed right over my head. Okay. Well, we've got an interesting case of the week for you today. In fact, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned our Bruxer full arch implant plant prosthesis and showed you kind of a sneak preview. Uh, today, actually, we're going to take a look at all the different components that make that up, including a new addition to the lineup, the PMMA bridge that the patient can actually wear home. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. You've had an opportunity to see the Bruxer full arch implant prosthesis before. Again, this is the solid zirconia product that... Um, Stands a chance of displacing the uh, hybrid denture sitting on top of a bar because it's not made of ac acrylic and denture teeth. This is all solid zirconia. You've seen us hammer a single unit Bruxer crown into a piece of wood before. That's at one and a half millimeters thick, and obviously this is a lot th thicker than that. So uh, we're trying to decide what to do. This, the hammer test is too easy for this. We need like a steamroller or drop it out of that big Red Bull rocket when that guy did that uh, dive from space, let it hit terminal velocity before it hits the ground. But I wanted to just kind of walk through uh, the steps with you because I got some emails from Dennis asking about the clinical steps. So the first thing that we typically get from the doctor is an implant level uh, impression. It doesn't matter if it's closed tray uh, or open tray, but we get that implant level impression. And the, the second appointment when you see the patient after you've taken this is going to be um, with the bite block, and the bite block is going to come with a, a couple uh, not engaging uh, inserts. And oops, a little screw fell out right there. And it's not going to actually have all these holes. It's just going to have two holes. It's going to get screwed into uh, two of the uh, implants. And so typically, it'll be two screws back in this area. I could probably screw this into place, although we don't really need it to be into place. But again, it's just. Uh, picking two of these that are, are roughly parallel, it's going to get screwed down into place. And as you can see, it's got some cutouts here to do the bite registration. So you're going to squirt some bite registration material uh, between um, this uh, wax rim try-in and uh, or bite block and the opposing. Uh, this would be a good time to start working on the vertical too, kind of like in a denture technique. You can remove uh, anything that you need here. You can add wax uh, where necessary. Uh, you're going to probably pick a shade uh, for the tooth as well at this appointment because at the next uh, appointment you're actually going to try in um, the setup. And the setup's going to look a little bit like the, um, like the final restoration looks, except it's going to be in wax. And now you will actually see that everything has, um, everything has all the holes have been placed in this. In fact, at this point we're going to decide whether or not multi-unit uh, abutments are necessary. In fact, if you look at our inclusive catalog, you'll see uh, several different versions of the multi-unit abutments uh, that are available. There's the straight multi-unit abutment, the 17-degree multi-unit abutment, and the 30-degree multi-unit abutment. And so 
Implants are rarely placed perfectly, unless they're done with a surgical guide, of course. When they're placed by hand, oftentimes some will be inclined to the mesial, some to the distal, some to the buccal. And so the multi-unit abutments allow you with the 17 degree angle and the 30 degree angle uh, to take care of some of those uh, off angle implants to get a more, to get a result like this where it draws a little better and we're gonna be able to have our bridge uh, sit down on top of it. You'll also notice that there's a couple different collar heights uh, on these as well. For example, the straights uh, come in a in the uh, 4.5, a 2 millimeter, a 3 millimeter, and a 5 millimeter uh, cuff height right along here. You know, on this arch that we see here, everything's perfect as we look from anterior to posterior. But typically, there could be an area where the bone drops down because the, the uh, extraction that was done there was done a couple decades ago. And so, when impa implants are placed. You know, we may have an implant that's uh, at this level and then another one sunk down a couple more millimeters. That allows us to take a multi-unit abutment with, say, a five millimeter cuff height and be able to place that there. So again, they're almost on an even plane here. So you'll notice that the multi-unit abutments not only give us um, some flexibility with implants that aren't all placed uh, in the same plane with the 17 degree angle and the 30 degree corrective angle, but also in terms of vertical height as well. Uh, if once the implants are placed, they're at different vertical angles, the multi-unit abutments allow us to line them up uh, a little bit better. And hopefully this is the type of result we're gonna get where we look at a model like this and, and everything draws pretty well and is in the same vertical plane because that's gonna give us the best results uh, for having a great final prosthesis. At this point, uh, when all the holes, all the implants are being accounted for, we're going to find out and see exactly where any of the access holes for the screws are going to be. Because sometimes we'll have something just because of the angulation of the implant where there's a screw hole coming out of the facial, perhaps of an anterior tooth. Sometimes you'll see it popping out of the side of a bicuspid. You might be able to get away with that and place a little composite uh, over it. And so we have some multi unit abutments that we see here. That'll be determined um, when the wax, the setup try-in is actually uh, being designed and being fabricated here in the lab. And so at that point, uh, if in fact there is a need for multi-unit abutments, you would put those uh, into the mouth um, at this time. And so one of the things we're gonna do besides this wax, trying to check that for aesthetics and phonetics and all that good stuff, this is gonna be the time for the verification jig. And so, it's going to come to you numbered like this on a model, depending on how many implants are there. You'll see how many segments that you have. And of course, these are going to be placed uh, on top of each of those and then screwed down into place. The white uh, material that we use to fabricate this jig uh, is, in fact, a triad. And so if you have triad in the office from, say, a custom tray technique, you can use that. Some dentists use uh, Duralay, you could use you know, flowable composite, you could use another acrylic or anything light curing. And you're going to screw all the segments of the verification jig uh, into place. And when they're all seated together, then we're going to loot all of these different segments together, hook them together. And as opposed to the beginning where an open tray or a, a closed tray impression would have worked, this is definitely going to be uh, an open tray that's used with a custom tray at this point. And so once all the parts of the jig have in fact been looted together. Then we're going to express our impression material around the jig into the tray, seat the tray, uh, clear the heads, let it set, and then unscrew all of these so we can take the jig out and it'll be contained in the custom tray and that will get sent back to the lab. And then it's time to put uh, the wax, the setup try-in into the patient's mouth and screw this down into place and get an opportunity to look at it and see how it looks in the patient's mouth. Is there anything that needs to be added? Are the teeth uh, positioned properly? How are the phonetics when the patients talk? Does it look like it's going to be uh, cleansable? Um, these are all important things to take care of. Is the patient happy with the shade? Because essentially when, when we're done with this, you know, there's one more chance down the road, but uh, essentially at this point, if you're in love with how everything looks, this can be sent back to the lab and it's going to be copy milled. This is essentially the template for uh, what's going to be the final Bruxer bridge. And so what you see here is what's going to be replicated in zirconia. So it's important that uh, at this point you're able to really make sure you have things dialed in. What we suggest, uh, what I suggest, and what we think is a, a better idea, and it's now really included as, as part of this service, is this uh, milled PMA, PMMA bridge that you see here. And again, 
Um, this was set up by hand. The, uh, the setup trying in wax is set up by hand. Uh, but then the file, once this is scanned, um, that's what's going to be used to mill this. And it can also be used to mill um, this PMMA bridge. And essentially what this polymethyl methacrylate bridge is, uh, is a long-term version of this, of the wax, or a short-term or provisional uh, version of the zirconia. So you can imagine placing this in the patient's mouth and having, say, 20 or 30 minutes to, to, trying to try to determine whether or not everything here is the way it should be. You know, you might be able to get a handle on the occlusion and if the patient likes the shade and the setup of the teeth. But really, what, what's it going to be like when the patient goes home and chews and try to eat with this on? Is it going to be cleansable? Is food going to be caught, you know, several places uh, because it's kept high and dry? Is the patient not going to be able to clean it because there's too much of an undercut under the flange? It's too much of a ridge lap. And these are difficult things to figure out in a 20 or 30 minute appointment, but if you're able to take a PMMA bridge and uh, put it into place and screw it into place for the patient, you know, now they're able to go home and wear this, you know, for a month or two, you know, a couple weeks if that's enough for you or for a month or two. Uh, if this is a male patient, they'll probably want to go home and show it to their um, significant other, if it's, uh, you know, their wife or whoever to make sure that they're happy, pleased with the way it looks aesthetically. They'll get a chance to talk much more you know, in the office, they can say, you know, 55 and uh, other things like that to check the phonetics. But really in their everyday speech where they go home and they get angry at their dog and they speak quicker and louder, or if they're the boss at work and they talk down to their employees, that kind of tone's a little bit different. And this really gives them a chance to kind of test drive what we saw in the wax uh, trying, but they can eat with the PMMA bridge. They can drink coffee. They can sleep with it on so they can have some parafunctional activity at night as opposed to just having this in for 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, in the old days, uh, dentists would use this and they would verify it in 20 or 30 minutes and then it, the full arch uh, prosthesis would be made from this. So you can do that, but it's much more prudent and that's why it's now included in the overall price of a case like this that this PMA, PMMA bridge is in there uh, at not only as a long-term provisional, if you will, but kind of a, a test drive of what this, the Bruxer Solid Zirconia Full Arch Bridge, uh, how it's going to act in their mouth. And so you can go into it with a lot more confidence knowing that, oh, okay, well, we've shortened these teeth just a little bit. And if you have shortened this teeth and maybe you've added a little something over here or taken something away, uh, when you're all done, you can unscrew this and send it back to the lab and then this will be what's scanned and used for the final restoration. If you have this PMMA bridge in place for, let's say, a month or two, and there are no issues, you don't have to change anything, that's fine too. The patient can just continue to wear this, and uh, this has already been scanned, and so the final restoration will be made identical to the PMMA one that you and the patient are happy with. They can just can simply continue to wear this until the permanent uh, solid zirconia bridge is ready to go in their mouth. If you take this out and send it back to the lab, obviously whatever they were, were wearing before the implants were done, maybe a full denture, or maybe you have an implant retained uh, biotemps bridge that sits on top of this, you would go back to that if you've made changes to the PMMA because that's now going to be a copy mill to come up with the final restoration. So that third appointment is um, the wax uh, setup try-in, the verification jig, and the final impression, and, and then you would try in uh, the PMMA bridge at that next appointment, wear it, uh, make any changes, and then the final uh, appointment is gonna be the delivery of the uh, final prosthesis once the PMMA has been sent in, and that is put into place. And you don't wanna really have to make any adjustments here. If you're making any adjustments, you'd like to be able to do it on the wax with the denture teeth, with the candle or denture teeth, or even once the patient wears it and finds a lateral interference because they weren't chewing food here in the office when you were checking them, now they're chewing food and they keep bumping a tooth over here. Making that adjustment in the PMMA is much easier than making it in the actual zirconia once it's done. So the utilization of the PMMA bridge as a long-term provisional is a great way for the patient to really be able to check all their excursions in some real-world circumstances, not sitting up or lying down in your dental chair, but going through all the particular motions and habits that they have on a regular day. So 
the ability to use the PMMA bridge, and of course it's not stained on the lingual like the final prosthesis will be because no one's going to see that here. This really is a great step to uh, make sure that the patient's happy with what they have and for you to be able to make any changes before the final restoration is actually done because this is a uh, big, uh, expensive, I mean it's uh, affordable at our lab compared to uh, a lot of other labs, but it's still an awful lot of work and you want to make sure that uh, the patient's totally happy with it. So the day you deliver this and put it in their mouth really should not be much of a change from what they've been wearing uh, for the last two months, except that uh, it should look better. And so what a great change for the patient to be able to come in and either switch from this directly to this or from a denture uh, to this. But regardless, they've had a chance to live with this in their mouth uh, and get used to this tooth arrangement. You've made any changes and it should take just about all the questions, if not all the questions, out of delivering the final prosthesis. And on that very last appointment, when the Bruxer Full Arch implant, implant Prosthesis goes into the patient's mouth, you should have a patient uh, who's very satisfied, uh, very happy with how it looks, and you should fe feel very satisfied uh, at the fact that this insertion appointment was simple and straightforward because of the use of the wax try-in and the PMMA bridge. By the way, all those steps that I just went over have been put together in a step-by-step -step, uh, restorative protocol. So if you're doing your first one of these cases, and you want to make sure you know exactly what you're doing, you can go to bruxer.com and in the lower left-hand corner of bruxer.com, you'll see one of the buttons you can click on is to download this restorative protocol. Uh, alternatively, you could also call the lab, talk to customer service and ask for the Bruxer's uh, full arch implant prosthesis protocol and have it mailed to you. But probably a lot faster to go to bruxer.com and look in the lower left-hand corner. And that way, when you go to actually do one of these cases for the first time, you'll have a step-by-step -step with photograph description of what needs to be done on each of the appointments from initial impression all the way to delivery. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's Viewer Mail comes to us from Dr. Gary Small, and he writes, Dear Dr. D and Megan, our practice, Manville Dental Group, uses your lab regularly. We have received a reverse prep kit and signed poster from Megan and Dr. D. We love Chairside Live and we repost it to our Facebook page where we have close to 950 friends. You're popular. Most to our fellow dentists. Number one question. There are rumors that your work does not stay in Newport Beach and goes out of country. Is there any truth to these rumors? If all your work is kept in the USA, I think you should put to rest these rumors and have a chairside live discussion about it. We presently use your lab for Bruxer crowns and bridges, Emacs veneers, hard soft night guards, implant abutments, and etc. Thank you, Dr. Gary Small. Well, thank you, Gary. I like the I like the name of the practice, Manville. Yes. Now, that might be the name of a, of a city. Sure. Or it's kind of like Man Cave. It's like Welcome to Manville, where you like do a root canal. And instead of like an ice pack, you know, it's a raw steak, oh, gosh, like on the Flintstones, like a brontosaurus right. uh -huh. thing to put on the side of your face. But um, Gary, yes, I've heard that rumor before, and I've been asked that question. Um, now, we have Glidewell here in Newport Beach, and then we've got BDL in Irvine, which is about a quarter of a mile away. And we do have some labs, um, sister labs, labs that are owned by us that are in different places. We have one in Riverside, California, one in Lake Havasu. We've got one in Costa Rica called Smith Sterling. We have Pacific Edge, which is down in Mexico. And all of those products are made in those individual countries. And of course, I'm referring to Costa Rica and Mexico when I say countries as opposed to the other cities. But otherwise, everybody's lab work stays within where they are. So yeah, we don't get cases here in, uh, in Newport Beach and ship them down to Mexico or Costa Rica to have them made. They're all, actually all made right here in these five huge buildings, but a lot of it right here in the building that I'm in right now, as a matter of fact. And uh, there's really no need to ship it anywhere else because the building that I'm in alone has about, you know, probably close to five or 600 technicians in it. In fact, um, that might be a good way to actually settle this once and for all. Because, because dentists come out and they take a tour mm -hmm. and they get a chance to walk through here and they're blown away because they just see technician after technician after technician. Right. And it's clear that the work isn't going anywhere. In fact, uh, we've, we've never done this, but yeah. I'm going, you're with child, so you stay um, here. But wait, I'm you're actually going right going, now? I'm going to go and I'm going to move and uh, I'm going to take a camera uh, with me if we have one. James, uh, can you grab a... Uh, camera and maybe does somebody have a microphone well here we are in the lobby of glidewell laboratories in newport beach california but how do i prove you we're actually in newport beach california oh i've got an idea james come here 
happen. Exhibit A, California state license plate. We got one here, we've got one here, we've got a whole parking lot full of it. Be an elaborate stunt if in China we decided to order 50 California license plate frames and put it on all these cars. Look at over here, US Bank, US Bank, US United States. Look at over here. Who else, what other country trims their shrubs like this? This early in the morning, this loud. Hey, turn that off! Where else in America would you find a late model muscle car like the Pontiac Firebird? Now, granted, you don't expect to see this in California. This car's much more at home down at the Jersey Shore, but still, it's in the United States. And if you needed more proof, Glidewell Laboratories, 4141 MacArthur Boulevard. And look, look what's right next to it. Bank of America, America. We're nowhere else but America. Oh, you think we photoshopped this? Can you do that? Can you bang on a Photoshop? I don't think so. Well, that's the outside of the building. Let's go ahead and take a look upstairs so I can offer more proof to you of exactly where we are. Oh, here we go. First of all, right here, the emergency defibrillator. Most foreign countries that I've been to, best you can hope for, an old car battery, a rusty screwdriver, and a couple old wires. That's it more proof for in America. Check out this vending machine. This only could happen in America. Five different types of potato chips, three different types of Cheetos crunching and flaming hot, and on the top row, Funyuns. If this were in any other country, they'd be called responsibility hunts. Not here, Funyuns. Here we are in the Bruxer department, the biggest department here at Glidewell Laboratories because of the runaway success of Bruxer. And everywhere you look, you'll see milling blanks. This is Bruxer 16. These are both C1, Who, who's prescribing C1 anyway? And look, you can see all the mills over here and all the ovens, it's just zirconia powder as far as the eye can see. All of it made right here in the United States. Ooh, in fact, I have an idea. Walk this way, come here, come here, come here. I've got it. Look out the window, come up to the window and look out to the corner and there you'll see at the Coal Center Newport in the middle, the American flag and on the right, the proud flag of the California Republic. That's right, you can't fake flags, it's illegal. We're in the United States, we're in California, we're in Newport Beach. How you like me now, China? What city are we in? Newport Beach, California. What city are we in? Newport Beach, California. That, that's how you get into management here, you know stuff like that. Hey, Nicole, you talking to a dentist? Ah, that's okay. What city are we in? Newport Beach. That is correct. Hello, doctor. Uh, he's gone. But the biggest reason why we don't have to send our work to an offshore laboratory is this. The significant investment in CAD CAM that was initially made by Jim Glidewell here at the laboratory. See, as labor rates continue to go up in the United States, by investing in all this equipment, the scanners, the mills, the ovens, everything we need to do to do Bruxer, for example, we are able to still provide these restorations at a very affordable price. Other laboratories not willing to make this investment would probably have to send it offshore and it might go to the Philippines or Vietnam or China. But because of this investment in CAD CAM, we can now do the work of hundreds of technicians with just about 20 of these machines. And so that is what has enabled us to keep all of the work here in Newport Beach, here in California, here in the United States without having to send it offshore. And that is the real story why everything can be made right here on site. So Gary, I hope oh, yeah. that after that, <laughs> you know, Oops, carry sorry. on, carry on. I was wondering what you did when I wasn't here. Uh, Gary, I hope that shows you that in fact, things are made here. In fact, if we get a chance, we'll take a look at some of our other laboratories and, and show you the same thing. Um, it's clear we don't have to send things uh, out to have them done. In fact, we just don't need to with our reliance on CAD CAM. Now it's really more in a sense about the machines than it is about the people anyway. And one of the benefits is, of course, we, we don't have to pay as much. Mm -hmm. um, I guess there are labs obviously who do send stuff offshore to be able to save money. But that's one of the great things about CAD CAM is with the machines, mm -hmm. you're able to save that money here in the United States instead of sending it offshore. I've seen some pretty evasive answers from other labs mm -hmm. too. I saw a lab online that was asked, um, they were answering questions and it said, is your uh, lab work made in China? And they said, you know, absolutely not. All of it's made in house. 
blah, blah, blah went on. Nothing's made in China. Uh -huh. um, their lab's in Vietnam. That's, that's okay. actually where it is. And so they never really, you know, they denied that it was made in right. China without actually saying, you know, right. lying what by was. omission. Right, exactly. Yeah. They were lying by omission. So it, it's nothing that we have to do here. We hear rumors all the time, too, that we've been bought by a big Chinese company. Glidewell was, so, was sold to somebody. So there's always, you know, rumors floating around mm -hmm. the industry, rumors that there's a big consolidation or roll up of. Uh, dental labs as well and so that's that's going to happen and uh, again all I can do is encourage all the doctors out there to write off a vacation come out to California visit uh, us on set visit us on set walk around the lab take mm -hmm. your kids to Disneyland write off the entire trip and really just come enjoy our nice weather here and that's get a right. chance get to come say hi at the beach. and get some ice cream at the beach Megan will take you for uh -huh. Ben and Jerry's yep. for any number Always. of flavors mm -hmm. uh, try to get here while she's still pregnant and craving it in a big way <laughs> yes thank you any news for us yes Police are looking for the person who stole 10 gold teeth and a jug of amalgam fillings from a dentist's office in North Carolina. It's not clear whether the crowns were still on the teeth or had been removed. The stolen gold is worth about $550. Investigators have no suspects and the case has been marked as inactive unless more information comes in. Well, you wouldn't necessarily know this, but pretty much in every dental office, mm -hmm. there are there is at least one uh, mayonnaise jar, for example, okay. uh, full of extracted teeth that mm -hmm. has crowns on it, where you can't tell if the metal is semi-precious or non-precious. Okay. Um, gold crowns that you've cut off uh, patients' teeth because they've got decay around it. And you'll take the gold down. You know, you don't want this stinky old thing, do you? And they're like, oh, gosh, no. You know, they yeah. just. And so you drop it into this mayonnaise jar full of formaldehyde or whatever, whatever you have yeah. in there. And so there are these jars, and usually in a dental practice, every once in a while, you'll wait till they fill up and turn it into a refiner or wait till gold here hits a certain amount mm -hmm. and turn it into a refiner. So it could have been with or without the teeth. But the amalgam filling part was the funny part. Right. Because that's, yeah, that's pretty worthless. Yeah, but not a lot there. And yeah. I'm not sure what... If there was a jar with, you know, amalgam fillings, it was probably just the used amalgam I'm that sure. wasn't being put in the teeth. That has to be, there's only two ways you can store amalgam in a human's mouth. All right. <laughs> or uh, it needs to have all this protocol taken care of sure. because the mercury vapor is not supposed to get out. Of course, you can put it in any human's head. But it goes to show that that kind of thing, you know, with only a value of $550, wasn't that much gold in there with yeah. gold hitting $1,800 you know, an ounce. I'm wondering if it was like an inside job, not to say the dentist, obviously, but... Um, maybe like a front ho front of the house worker, receptionist, or something. Or if somebody really broke in and stole this gold, these gold teeth, thinking you know this person's gonna make a payday. But it's gotta be. Know. It would have to be somebody with probably less knowledge than than the office staff. I would. I'm gonna go with True. cleaning company, hey. or the dentist's son if he was cleaning the office. And I only say that. Because I used to clean my dad's office and steal all kinds of stuff. Oh, gosh. I can only <laughs> and bring imagine. it to school. Mostly? <laughs> like what? Toys from the toy box? No, like, um, this is awful. Um, back in the old days, you used to mix uh, amalgam yourself where you have liquid mercury and oh, powders. Wow. And so my dad used to have this bottle of liquid mercury in the office. You brought that so to school. I, would, I took it to school because it, it was amazing. You could squirt a little on the desk and hit it and you go into a million little pieces. <laughs> And then you can put it back together. There's a lot, I could drop that cup and it'll go in 100 pieces, but you right. can't go like this uh -huh. and have it go back together. And the mercury would, and we would all play with it for hours all that day long. And that's, healthy, I started right? losing my hair yeah. right around then, mm -hmm. too. And that was, uh, and a lot of the kids in my class, <laughs> you should see our reunion. No <laughs> hair. All 10 of us standing there, no hair at all. I feel <laughs> like it's my fault. It probably, Anything else? Yes. A Michigan inmate must pay $353 after a failed lawsuit. He blamed prison officials for his bad teeth, claiming his teeth and gums suffered because he was denied toothpaste. The state denied the allegations and said that the man had only five teeth when he entered prison. A jury ruled in favor of the state, and now the man must pay the $353 bill for transcript costs, copy fees, and the state's cost of the one-day trial. Did you say he had to pay for the transcript costs? Yeah. Well, it's just such a funny story because... Um, he claims that it's funny on so many levels. He showed up with only five teeth. What are the Plus chances they were in pristine shape? And the other ones have been accidentally knocked mm, out at a hockey game, for example. And slim to slim to none. And, and toothpaste, you don't need toothpaste. I mean, toothpaste <laughs> is something fun. You know, it tastes good. It mm. bubbles up. But uh, dry brushing just on its own, whether it's with a Sonicare or just with a regular sure. brush, does everything it does with toothpaste. Yes, there's some topical fluoride in the toothpaste, but... 
I wish he would have researched a little more and come up with a slightly better claim than I lost my five teeth because I was denied access to toothpaste. Oh, bless his heart. I just feel bad for him because he doesn't... Do you have a picture of him? No? I don't. There was no picture included. But, um, yeah, he was maybe thinking that he could get some money out of it, maybe get his teeth fixed. I don't know, but... And 353 bucks in prison. That's like eight cigarettes. That's like... I mean, how many years does it take to make? Is that what you make in a year? I mean, is this like, is he being docked like a year's worth of pay right. at the laundry for this lawsuit? <laughs> and that was my question. I was trying to think of like, how do they expect prisoners to pay if they're obviously not working? Well, I think they do, though. I think they in, do like, they make license plates. They right. make, or that's a But you have anyway. to be on like good behavior. You have to be like in good standing, I think, to get those jobs, right? Right. Let's I think hope so. he was. Um, but otherwise, would you just have like a family member on the outside wire you some money? They or? might be able to wire you some money, but you can always shank a guy and get some money that way. Or You've been sell your mashed break potatoes. Too much. I've, yeah, I've been watching prison breaks. All right. Thank you, Megan. Uh-huh. Appreciate that. That'll about wrap it up for this week's edition of Chairside Live here from Newport Beach, California. On behalf of myself, all the technicians you met, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality American-made dentist. We'll see you next time. All I have to say is that I may or may not have six cartons of Ben & Jerry's in my freezer right now. Actually, make that five because I finished the last one off last night. What flavor? Oh, dear God, any and all, but I really am enjoying the um, chocolate chip cookie dough because you because mm. you can eat that because it's pasteurized. They can't sell raw egg. Um, oh, good point. Half baked. Oh my goodness! Somebody just hold me. And then um, cinnabuns. No. Cinnabuns. That is. Cinnabuns. A, yep, buns, bun, cinnabun. I don't know. It's cinnamon ice cream with like c- cinnamon roll dough and like a buttery cinnamony swirl. Wow. Oh, I'm drooling. Cherry Garcia, but that's Brandon's. Is that? There's ice cream? Oh, so Brandon actually has one. He, yeah, no, he get, well, I don't eat them a carton at a time. I really take my time, but like, I'll buy, because they Yeah, but you eat them right from the carton. Oh, hell yeah. No yeah, one puts because... Ben and Jerry's in a, in a bowl. It's, then you, no. you'd scoop well, the whole thing out. Well, classy people, but yeah. Yeah, no, right. How you like me now, China?